a great pleasure to be here with my pal, uh, Peter Blakian, who's a wonderful, wonderful poet. Uh, Peter and I have you know, been leading these weirdly parallel lives. Um, so my life is a very much a split screen existence. I always have uh, you know, my daily life in one half of my brain and then uh, the experiences that you have uh, going to places like Somalia etc. So uh, some of these poems will take off that, but this doesn't have anything to do with that. I, th I thought I'd start with a poem about um, language, since that's what we're all doing, right? Only this language isn't spoken, uh, is what a dog might say. And you know how dogs are when they want something from you? They look at you, they look at the door, <laughs> And look back at you. <laughs> <laughs> what the dog really says. It wasn't language, but eyeage, the dog spoke. <laughs> Looking at the door, then at me, then at the door. Its eyes signaling something more than what Chekhov said the dog smelled in each corner of the room. The unquestioned superiority of human beings. Nor was it what Nietzsche thought when he wrote that a dog comes up to the philosopher as if to ask a question, but then forgets the question. <laughs> For there was no question when the dog licked the hand. There was a smell of a kind that the dog must have known so well from when the hand took it out for walks and the dog plunged its nose in the frozen meat of a dead gull, on a day so cold only the faintest microbial whiffs of rot could thread their way up the dog's nostrils and knot and unknot in its brain. What the dog really says is that if a dog could talk, we couldn't understand it. And so the dog moves in harmony of nose to smells, claws clicking on the sidewalk as it marks with a squirt of piss this tree, that fence post, the laminar overlays of scent like pages leaf through in a diary in which each entry keeps changing in a present that has no future but only a fading past. For three days and nights, the dog didn't move from under the bed where the man whose hand it licked for the salts on the hand, the subtly changing salts, lay unmoving. But why did the dog keep lying there once the body was zipped away into a body bag, wrestled onto a gurney as the undertaker, unshaven, <laughs> in rumpled white shirt with maybe gravy stains on the collar, his black slacks and jacket fitting a little too tight, tried to make the dog move until the dog showed its teeth and began to bark. What's in the dog-hearted, dog-brained dog's heart? And why would we say that a dog is afraid his master will beat him today, but not that a dog is afraid his master will beat him tomorrow. The salts on the man's hand, that they smell and taste of what a dog smells and tastes when it rolls on its back in half-rotten flesh and comes running with that odor wafting from its matted down fur toward the hand that feeds it and that it licks. Things to be eaten, smelled, sat upon, run away from. Things that die, but don't make a dog fearful. The many ways dogs bark in the dwindling languages, bow wow, bluff bluff, how how, gong gong, tia tia. What does the dog know of this? 
its features scrunching up into a puggish wrinkle. I'm worried. Shouldn't you be, Face? <laughs> and I'll read some poems from this book. Um, goodness gracious, look at all these post-its. How depressing. Uh, <laughs> So much more interesting for folks to make their way into it, right? This poem is called Homage uh, to Zidane, and Zidane is the ethnic Algerian soccer player uh, who played for the French team during the uh, World Cup. And uh, because one of the Italian players insulted his sister and his ethnic origin, he headbutted the other player. Quite a cause, celebra. Um, and I was in uh, Lebanon at the time when this was happening. Uh, so it was a very interesting time to be there. Uh, there was a sort of a mini civil war going on. Anyway, homage to Zidane. In all the cafes on the seafront, Whatever could be seen kept exploding in riots of blue, red, green. Horns everywhere, hooting for the ball, soaring toward the net. Slicks of trash and plastic glinting from the waves. The world was in a fever to see the perfect goal. The giant screens on every corner, loud with the locust thrum of satellite hookups. Between two limestone cliffs, I plunged into the filth, sucked a mouthful of oil, and set out swimming hard to where I heard rising voices shouting in Arabic, score, score. A big wave swept me under, another and another, until I shot out of the water that gleamed like a forehead, budding mine. Expert, but without malice, threatening to drag me down until I slid out on the rocks. I shivered and wanted to live in the clear light of the announcer's voices, echoing in different languages, weaving a net so fine the sun could pass through it. Yet you could see an instant replay, the ball, caught and caught and caught, and not one stitch of that fabric going taut. So much for the FIFA. <laughs> Soccer is a beautiful dream of the kind of world humanism that no one believes in anymore. Um, the next poem, I'm just going to read excerpts from since it's quite long, and it's called Homage to Basho. And Basho was a 17th century Japanese poet uh, who basically pioneered the form called haibun. And uh, haibun is just a prose uh, travelogue punctuated by poems. So the poem is uh, for my friend Christopher Merrill, and it has to do with a trip uh, that we took to Iraq. Um, about a year ago, December, and um, anyway, um, the country was coming apart at that time, hadn't totally come apart the way it has now, and uh, basically we were traveling around the country, we were meeting uh, Iraqi writers and students, uh, students of English, English is an immensely popular subject there. Uh, they had over 3,000 majors in English at the University of Basra alone. And, you know, we talked about literature, we talked about <coughs> creative writing, which is something that doesn't exist over there. And uh, it was an amazing uh, trip to see people under such terrible pressure in day-to-day -day circumstances. Um, something like 100 people a day were being blown up. And it's quite odd. Uh, I'm not Brian Williams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> have the Hebrew gene, but 
Anyway, there I was. What I have to say about my trip meanders the way the Tigris and Euphrates meander, and like those rivers in flood, is sometimes murky in intention, balked in its conclusions, and flows where it has to flow. In Iraq, in which the customs and conventions were often operating invisibly, or easily misinterpreted to be the same as mine, I suppose I gave up on telling a straightforward story. Instead, one night in a helicopter, what I felt in the air, so different from what was happening on the ground, made me realize that when you take an oath to tell the truth, you're not telling that truth, either to the judge or to the courtroom. Perhaps the point of the oath is to try to surround yourself with the lightness and solitude from which you can speak the truth, adding whatever light and shade you can so as to make the how implicate the why. After all, the judge and the members of the court weren't riding in the helicopter, so a realistic description won't mean anything to anyone unless you add that light and shade which only you, as the witness, could perceive. But even then, in the helicopter roar, the truth may be hard to hear, even in your own ears. Skip over a bit. We made a trip to uh, southern city Basra. Going to Basra. Shamash, the sun god, the god of justice who lays bare the righteous and the wicked when he floods the world with light, came walking down the muddy-looking Tigris into Basra, where gas flares from the refineries burning all night faded into the Dash 8's prop whirring just beyond the window. So much gas was burning off into the air the plane was descending through that a skin of light kept rippling over the city's cinder block and rebar, tilting up at the plane's belly, swooping down. In my book, I read how the deluge made the dikes give way. The gods crouched like dogs with their tails between their legs, terrified at the storm demons they themselves let loose. At the end of six days and nights, with Napishtim and his wife send out a raven that never returns. The ark runs aground on a mountain top, just above the storm waters that have beaten the world flat into mud and clay. And Utnapishtim and his wife offer the god's sweet cane, myrtle, cedar, and the god's smell the savor, the gods smell the sweet savor. The gods hover like flies over the sweetness. And then we had to go to, uh, you know, lots of different schools and whatnot, and uh, bulletproof vest, uh, what's this? How do I put that on? I proved myself to be inept at putting on my bulletproof vest, attaching this to that in all the wrong places, before figuring out how to Velcro the waist panels tightly around my stomach so that they were under the vest, not over it, and adjusting and readjusting the shoulder straps to make sure they were tight. I didn't look very military. In fact, I looked like I was wearing a bib, a sort of Rambo Jr. <laughs> now that I was strapped into my vest, it felt fairly lightweight, around eight pounds, thick enough, according to the specs, to give reasonable protection against handguns. But when you consider that a bullet fired from a military-style weapon is the equivalent of a five-pound sledgehammer smashing into you at 45 miles per hour, serious bruising and broken ribs are pretty much guaranteed. I put on my helmet and snapped the chin snap fast, 
but I had to keep pushing it back from sliding down over my eyes. Rather than protected, I looked and felt like an overgrown infant. In front of our armored vehicle, a Chevy Suburban SUV reinforced with steel plating, a beefy but terminally polite security contractor dressed in khakis, a brown knit shirt, a gray windbreaker, lightweight hikers, and sporting a buzz cut gave us a briefing. Once you're inside the vehicle, please stay away from the doors. We'll let you in and out. If we take fire, or if I give you the signal to get down, I'd appreciate it if you could get on the bottom of the vehicle. <coughs> I'll climb in back with you and cover you. Once we get to our destination, you can leave your armor and helmets in the vehicle. Then we'll open the doors and we'll proceed single file to our destination. Everything clear? <laughs> car cover. The car cover blown halfway off the car, billows and bags sagging back to a slack void before being blown wide open, almost as if a man or a man and a woman or a woman and her soldier wrestled over and over, amorous and or murderous in the cold wind, the weak Christmas Day sun lighting in stark shadow the shredded plastic bags billowing in leafless branches above what keeps billowing below. A duet singing what's above to what's below, sky and earth concentrating, all their powers on what could be three or four or countless small wars rolling over the earth's surface the way the canvas rolls in the animating wind. The corners at war with the center they want to tear free of. The center tugging and yanking at the corners. But it's all just a piece of canvas sewn to fit over roof and windshield and hug bumper and headlights. So ingeniously tailored that even this small skill rebukes me for my seeing in its roiling sullen gas flares breaking out all over the earth and the security contractors who are paid to keep me safe wearing their in-ear radio receivers hearing what's going on out there as we move in the armored suburban among the lucky and the doomed until one or the other or both lie still as the car cover going slack over the skin of the abandoned car. And then we would do workshops with students and we did a very simple exercise and that is we would simply say to them, yeah, think back to your childhood at home and think of some memories of it and we would basically say what I want you to do is you know, you're in your childhood home and your mother and father there you know, what do you see? What kind of weather is it? Is there a favorite toy you had? That kind of thing. And we asked them to do this in the exercise. We wanted to say every time they had a memory, they would say, I remember, I remember, I remember. And then at a certain point, we would say to them, and now what I want you to do is I want you to change it. And what I want you to write is, I don't want to remember. And at that moment, everything would change in the room. And this is a generation of people who have grown up at war. Uh, they've never known a time when they either weren't at war with Iran, uh, with the United States. Um, so inevitably, the war came up as a subject. And they told us things that they would never have told us in the casual conversation. We'd been there for years and years. So there was one particular young woman who I especially remember. In one of our workshops, a slight young woman wearing a black and white headscarf with a round face and large black eyes and with just a hint of mascara on the lashes stood up to read her poem. Her name, I think, was Miriam and she stood very straight in front of her classmates and read to us with a quiet, 
unselfconscious dignity. Her pronunciation was excellent, so I have a good memory of what she wrote. She said that she was woken near dawn by her older brother in her bedroom, who had bent down to gently kiss her on the cheek and to ask her if she wanted anything special in the market. And when she looked up at him to tell him no, he said to her very gently that this would be the last time she'd be seen. But she was so sleepy, she didn't quite take in what he meant. And a moment later, he was gone. Later that morning, she wrote, she was in the kitchen having breakfast with her mother. And then their neighbor came in and gave them the news. She wrote that as she heard the news, she felt herself get smaller and disappear. She had no hands, no face, no body to feel with. There was no kitchen, no mother, no her. The neighbor, she wrote, told them about the car accident. She wrote how she remembers her brother's words coming back to her, how gentle he was when he kissed her on the cheek, how he would always bring her special things from the market. And then she sat down, seeming completely self-possessed, except for the sadness that had come into her voice and hung now in the room. No one said anything for a while. It was what she hadn't said, didn't need to say, since everyone in her generation already understood, resonated for a few moments. Chris and I looked at each other, but were slower in grasping what it was she'd left out. And then it dawned on us, too. Her brother had been a suicide bomb and blown himself up in the car. For all the violence going on in Iraq, in my little white box of a chew, my container housing unit, it was eerily calm, and no wonder. The entire complex of chews was covered by a huge steel roof and surrounded by 20-foot high reinforced concrete blast walls to keep bombs and missiles from falling right on your head was how the fellow who gave me the key to my chew put it. This kept the whole compound perpetually in shadow, but it added to the feeling of isolation and quiet. There's a poem by Thomas Tranströmer in which he's in a motel room so anonymous that faces of his old patients begin to push through the walls. The chew was something like that, a refuge from the violence, a deprivation chamber I was grateful to retreat to, but also a little theater of the mind in which what happened during the day came back to haunt me in the ammonia smell of disinfectant mixed with drying mud that exuded from my chew. Miriam's face came back many times, and the face of her brother, though I could never quite make out his face because it was always too close to hers. I could see the shape of his head as he bent down to her ear, but his body was lost in shadow. His gentleness and the violence of his final act resisted my attempts to explain or understand. Of course, I was imposing on his entire past the moment when he pressed send, making that moment more significant than a thousand other moments, which, as he'd lived them, would have had their own weight and value a back page newspaper photo of smoke pouring up, a vague ghost face pushing forward into the white walls of my shoe. Except for the glimpse Marion had given me, that was all I could see. Meanwhile, inside my shoe, I led a radically simplified life. No decorations, purely functional furniture, and not much of it, and a gas mask against sarin and other forms of nerve gas, packed neatly in a small cardboard box with a convenient black plastic handle. The warning read, do not remove. The chopper's sides were open to the night air, 
and I instinctively shoved myself back on the bench as far as I could get. Not very far, it turned out. Certainly not far enough to quell my unease about hurtling through the air with no door in front of me. Everything was dark down below for the first quarter mile, and then we were crossing over Baghdad, the lights of the cars on the road flickering softly, house lights shining in the windows. The contractor gave me thumbs up, and I at least knew enough to give thumbs up back. He slid the lens of his night vision goggles past the lip of his helmet and down over his eyes to keep watch for snipers on the ground, and then we slowly ascended, the nose of the chopper dipping slightly as the tail lifted up, and we soared straight up until the pilot adjusted the pitch of the rotors, and we shot ahead, eventually climbing to about 100 feet over the city. The pilot occasionally flicked a switch on the instrument panel, and then as we rose even higher and the night air got very cold, the contractor slid the glass doors closed on the passenger part of the tiny cabin. Just above the pilot's helmet, silhouetted against the curved glass of the windshield, shimmered another little galaxy. Switches glowing in the darkness, an overhead instrument panel lit up the pilot's hand as he leisurely lifted his left arm from time to time to switch something off or on. For a moment, I felt immensely happy. I had the reverie of myself as a child, looking up at day glow stars stuck to the ceiling over my bed. A memory I knew to be false, since I'm way too old for such things to have existed when I was a kid, and nor were my parents the type to indulge me with day glow stars. <laughs> I knew, even as I took pleasure in it, that my fantasy was out of sync with the reality on the ground, not to mention the contractor hunching forward, his gun in his lap, intently scanning the darkness below. At least the contractor had his orders and his night vision goggles. One of Saddam's former palaces, encircled by a moat that testified to the dead dictator's love of water, glowed dimly below us, looking like an Arabian Nights fantasy in bad taste and reputed to have a torture chamber in the basement. Aloft in the chopper and looking down, I found and continue to find it hard to know what tone to take when the truth is both atrocious and banal. And if you are on the ground looking up? In an oral history of the Iraq War, I'd come across this account of a pregnant woman, Rana Abdul Mahdi, who lives in Sadr City. I saw a helicopter floating very high in the air away from me, and I watched as it fired a rocket toward me and my little sister, Zara. She was eight. I felt heat all over my body, and then I was on the ground as the street filled with smoke. There were bodies all around me, and I saw my sister with all her insides spilling out her front. She was reaching for me, motioning with her hand for me to come and help. I saw my left foot was gone. It was sitting there in the street a little ways from me. UH-1N. The light lift Huey rose from the floor of night into the darkness of the brain where it felt the sullen winds pushing it this way and that, following the current of a thought into a blankness and far-seeingness, that, as I rose in the actual chopper, released me to confront the scabbard of Orion's belt. Behind him, the scorpion menaced his exposed heel. But then the rotor roar filled up the space between night sky and ground dark. The imagination slipped down over my eyes like a pair of night vision goggles. What they showed me was myself strapped in, staring down at Baghdad at one of Saddam's kitsch palaces that looked like something out of the thousand and one nights 
in which only Scheherazade's unending flight of words to keep the Sultan from murdering her can preserve her from his scimitar. How picturesque the imagination envisions the storied world lit up by infrared. How the helicopters retracted doors, letting in the cold night air, refreshed and restored the Sultan in me, while putting under threat of death the insurgent imagination that thinks it can talk its way out of the void it hovers in, its blades rendered an invisible blur as it holds its position in the darkness, intent <clears throat> on the levitating heaviness that allows it to convince itself, suspended in the air, that it's really weightless. And I'll finish with one last one. Uh, I always want to recover the world with the world of the domestic. This is about my uh, almost daughter. Yeah. I want to say daughter, but she's my almost daughter. Because <laughs> I came into her life when she was uh, nine, eight, and uh, you know, really, you're not really her biological father, but you feel like her father. So we now have this almost daughter. I'm her ad, and she's my ad. Almost daughter, almost dad. <laughs> <laughs> or I can be her dad, her dear almost dad. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things you can do. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking DOA. <laughs> yeah. Dear old dad. <laughs> Second sight. In my fantasy of fatherhood, in which I'm your real father, not just the almost dad, arriving through random channels of divorce, you and I don't lie to one another. <clears throat> Shrugging each other off when words get the best of us, but coming full circle with wan smiles. When you hole up inside yourself, headphones and computer screen taking you away, I want to feel in 10 years that if I'm still alive, you'll still look at me with that same wary expectancy. Your surreptitious, cool-eyed appraisal, debating if my love for you is real. Am I destined to be those sharp-faced waves that my death will one day make you enter? You and your mother make such a self-sufficient pair. In thrift stores, looking for your prom dress, what father could stand up to your unsparing eyes, gauging with such erotic calculation your figure in the mirror? Back of it all, when I indulge my second sight, all I see are dead zones. No grandchildren, no evenings at the beach, no bonfires in a future that allows one glass of wine per shot of insulin. Will we both agree that I love you always, no matter my love's flawed, aging, partiality? My occupation now is to help you be alone. Thank you. Woo.